Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Small Cap Discoveries Conference Call. Today on our call, we have Prad Sakar, the CEO of CB2 Insights. CB2 Insight trades on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol CBII and on the OTC under symbol CBIFF. The company is trading at about 53 cents with roughly 98 million shares outstanding or about a $52 million market cap. I'd now like to hand it over to Paul Andriola. Great. Thanks, Trevor. Um, yes, welcome, Prad. Um, happy to have you here uh, today. Um, uh, for, Thank you. Happy to be here. Great. For, for reference, um, I found out about you guys probably three or four months ago, just before uh, you guys, your, your, your stock took off. So um, I wish we had interviewed you a couple months ago, but I guess this will have to do. Um, Prad, again, welcome here. And uh, I understand you have a presentation. I'd love for you to, uh, to start that off and introduce yourself to the, uh, the listeners. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Paul, and and always happy to walk through the story. So uh, um, I'll take a few minutes here just to give a quick introduction and certainly would like to jump into the presentation and do a walkthrough. Uh, so I'm one of the two co-founders, the CEO of uh, CB2 Insights. Uh, the company started about five years ago. Um, my co-founder and I, Cash Crush, who spent the last 20 years in the clinical practice management space. Um, our, ex our experience has always been in the ownership and management of uh, multidisciplinary health models, kind of large health institutions. Uh, on the Canadian side with five years of that now being on the US market. What we're effectively looking to do here with CB2 Insights is really to disrupt the way sort of healthcare is approached within the US market. Our model is kind of multidisciplinary health centers building a national network of healthcare services for patients under typical insurable services models um, by being able to also support patients in an uninsured model, utilizing both in clinic as well as virtual telemedicine as a way to support uh, the delivery of patient care. Um, so just as a quick overview, today we operate across 14 states. It's actually uh, 15 now. Um, the, uh, the, the states include sort of, and I'll talk about the states as we go through them. Uh, we have about 30 plus clinics across these states. Uh, collectively, between the virtual telehealth platform and these physical clinics, we're treating a little over 120,000 patients now. Um, and the primary services have been sort of integrative care, primary care, urgent care. And I'll talk about how our thesis and business model works for how we intend to build on this business. Um, our infrastructure in the U.S. is strong. We have over 150 employees across our clinical assets. We employ over 50 healthcare providers that treat these 110,000 patients. And as I mentioned, uh, Cash and I have, uh, as founders, have, have had a lot of experience in, in running these types of business models and building these effective multidisciplinary health centers. Um, just to highlight for the listeners some key inflection points uh, for CB2 Insights this year, uh, we did see our first full quarter of profitability in Q2. 2019 was really a year of focusing on profitability and making sure our costs were in line. We were able to achieve that leaving 2019. Um, certainly Q2 was, was a major milestone for the company and we've seen that trend continue to Q3 as well. Uh, now with the base of profitability, focus is back on growth. We really wanna make sure that we have top line growth as a, as a key driver now moving forward. Um, we've now completed a, a oversubscribed private placement about a month ago, followed on by an announcement today of a bought deal. Um, collectively, the company will have near $10 million of cash following both financings, which is going to be very creative now to be placing towards both organic and growth opportunities. Um, we've also recently converted our death note in the company, which is basically rid of, rid of all, of all long-term liabilities. So uh, profitable operations, no debt, strong, strong uh, cash in the balance sheet, um, and a historic uh, success of M&A transactions. We're quite excited to see what uh, the next 12 to 18 months is going to bring in terms of growth for the company. So we focus our business in the U.S. market. Um, we are a U.S. focused company. And the reason is, uh, again, 20 years of operations of clinical models, five of those in the U.S. Uh, the U.S. offers far more attractive, um, uh, a far more attractive setting for building the type of business we're building. So the three key reasons. Number one, U.S. Uh, healthcare services operate profitably. Uh, in Canada, it's very difficult to find uh, a medical practice that has any profitability margins because the gross margins are so low. Physicians here get paid on a, on typically on a fee-for-service basis, and that leaves you know, anywhere from 70 to 90% of the revenue going out the door right away to the provider. So with you know, 10 to 30% gross margins, you're, you're lucky if you break even. The U.S., uh, because of the regulations, it's really difficult to be able to incentivize physicians on any kind of um, sort of revenue share basis. So you end up paying your providers on a flat fee or hourly or salary basis. So we get closer to a 70% gross margin in the US because of this. So far more room for economy of scale and we're able to achieve anywhere from a 20 to 30% profitability margin on our clinical operations. 
Secondly, the reimbursable rate in the U.S. is significantly higher than the reimbursable rate in Canada. So for an average family doctor visiting Canada, a doctor gets paid somewhere between $30 and $50, depending on the province and the type of service they bulk together. That same service in the U.S., that same 15-minute slot, can earn me somewhere from $150 to $300 per visit, just because of the reimbursable rates from insurance companies. So, you know, you're making more on a per-patient basis. You're also keeping more because of your incentivization, uh, lack of incentivization for a doctor on payments. So it becomes far more feasible to build a really strong business model within the U.S. market. Um, when you're dealing with 300 million patients, I mean, the depth is huge. Um, an average family care patient can spend somewhere from $500 to $1,000 a year. That's three to four visits a year. Um, and again, with 80% of it paid for by the health insurer. So, you know, ultimately for the patient, I think delivering effective care on, a, on, a, on an ongoing basis is going to be really key to helping us sort of achieve that annual optimal health care spend per year. Um, our business model works um, very plain and simple, actually. So a multidisciplinary model, the way that cash and again, this is a tried, tested and true method that we've run for the last 20 years. Every one of our clinics is built around a primary care doctor. Your family doctor is the gatekeeper of all services. So when you, in, in essence, have the family care provider service, you can refer those patients. You have some control over where those patients go. So number one, you monetize, of course, on the visits on the patient on the primary care side. But number two, you have the ability to also then be able to play within those referral services. In a, in a multidisciplinary model, it's about studying where those patients are going and then saying, I need to bring those services in-house. So for a patient, you're getting a much uh, more holistic uh, sort of a one-stop shop approach to healthcare, and they like it because they're within the facility they know and understand. And as a clinic, we get to recognize the revenue from the billings of those services. So let's say I have, you know, 20% of my patients being referred off of cardiology services down the street to the hospital. Well, now I'll have a cardiologist come in, say, once a month or once every two weeks, and they'll be booked up with our own patients, and we can recognize the billings for the insurable services that they deliver to those patients. And so as we continue to um, deploy this multi-layered service on top of every primary clinic that we own, our goal is to continue to build on that, of course, service to the patient, but then also on a a, a, a annual revenue recognition basis, the, the revenue per patient should be able to grow from 1,000 to 2,000 to 3,000 and so forth. Um, and we see this successfully being done. Companies like Oak Street Health in the US, um, they generate on average about two to $3,000 a year per patient. Now they focus just on Medicare patients, which is 65 years and above, but their target is 12,000 a year per patient. So clearly there's a lot of runway for growth here. Uh, on average right now, our revenue per patient is at 150 a year. So immediately we'll see some inflection of growth organically as we continue to expand on insurable services to build revenue on top of an existing base. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that as we go through it. Um, sorry, I should also mention on here, you know, we, we do utilize technology and I think it's important to touch on where it plays a role in our business. So for us, technology is a delivery mechanism. It's a way to innovate on care. We do have our own proprietary uh, electronic health record system that we built in-house um, and we have a team of developers that maintains it on an ongoing basis. Um, and obviously, it, of course, it helps with keeping the clinic running efficiently, it helps with standardization of processes and quality of care. It also helps us innovate in the way we deliver healthcare to patients. So we do benefit from having our own in-house telemedicine platform that we build as part of our system. Um, certainly became more effective this March when everything went into shutdown. And the way we see telemedicine really is a way to help optimize, again, patient care. Now, what most people have been able to see over the last six months is, let's call it 80% of visits with a doctor can be done remotely. But those 20% of services you need physical intervention for, well, those need to be done in person and generally generate the bulk of revenue for a clinic as well. So technology for us allows us to say, well, let's keep 80% of the patient visits out of the clinic. Patients don't need to come in for that. And let's keep 20% of the visits in clinic and let's make sure the time is available in clinic to spend on those 20% of patients so that we're not just spending 15 minutes in a visit that could be done remotely in five minutes. So technology is very important to us. It, it allows us to really figure out how to optimize the capacity utilization per provider, really squeeze the gross margins out of the business, and ultimately, at the end of the day, give the patient what they're looking for, and then build on that fee-for-service model basis. Um, we do touch on data and technology and research and development. We think these are future opportunities for the company. Being able to aggregate, of course, real-world evidence on the treatments between patients and their clinicians and patients and their prescriptions and outcomes is really important that we think we'll be able to commercialize into larger stakeholders like pharma companies, regulators, and payers. Um, we're already seeing them spending quite a lot of money in this sector today. And I think as we continue to build our core asset of a company, 
this will become something in the future we think we'll be able to leverage. Um, and then secondly, of course, on research trials, uh, recruiting patients remains one of the most costliest and, and time-consuming aspects of a clinical trial. So being able to utilize a growing network of patients, technology to pinpoint these patients on clinical trials allows us to participate in the hundreds of trials that are, on, that are ongoing within the U.S. market and, again, create new commercial monetization opportunities for the company. So looking forward at CB2, this is where we see growth coming from, sort of three key pillars. Um, the first pillar is within our existing infrastructure. So as I mentioned, we have about 100,000 patients today. Um, our average revenue per patient is about 150 a year based on the services delivered. What we can expect to see over the next 12 to 18 to 24 months is the expansion of insurable services to this existing patient group, where just for example, say we can take 10% of our patients, say 10,000 patients who are going from 150 a year to maybe 500 a year to maybe 1,000 a year in revenue due to the increase in services delivered to them, we can incrementally see our revenue go from 1.5 for that base of 10,000 patients to 5 million to 10 million, which can presumably create some substantial revenue growth for the company. And of course, on a base of profitability, we'll, we'll immediately lend to our EBITDA margins as well. But for the patient, they're getting far more from our organization than what they're getting today. So this will be a very organic, low-hanging fruit opportunity that we're going to pursue over the next 12 months. Um, it, does, it is a process in the U.S. to go through this, which is why it can't be switched on tomorrow. But it is something that we are underway with. And over the next 12 months, I think we'll start to see those numbers really materialize and turn into some, um, some very attractive growth, um, growth revenue numbers. Um, the second area of growth for us is the ability for us to disrupt a uninsured market population. So you know, there's, there's a growing concern what happens if the Affordable Care Act gets repealed, what happens if these changes happen. And the reality is there's about 40 million people in the U.S. today who already don't have health insurance and won't qualify for one of these Medicaid or Affordable Care Act programs. And because of cost, it's just too expensive. It's too prohibitive for them to get access. Um, so they end up Googling their situation or going to the emergency when it gets really bad um, or trying to self-diagnose. And so what we can try and do with our current infrastructure and what we're doing now is we've launched a very um, low cost opportunity for the uninsured market. It's a $200 a year annual subscription program. It's only delivered on telemedicine. So if I'm an uninsured patient, I can pay 200 bucks a year to Skylight. I can call and get an appointment with a healthcare provider, same or next day. Those doctors already work for us. So it's not like we're necessarily adding on any cost here. We're actually quite profitable that $200 a year. But for the patient, we now create an avenue for 40 million people to get access to a healthcare provider where they could not easily or could not from an affordability standpoint. And because this is a parallel revenue stream to insurable services or uninsured patients, we won't see this cannibalizing on our insurable services market. So we think that this is a nice little parallel growth area that's untapped, underserviced. And we think our infrastructure lends us the ability to go in and help within, that, within the un uninsured community of patients. Um, and then the third will be through M&A. And this is where, again, historically, we've been quite successful at acquiring medical clinics. It's a highly fragmented industry. Um, there's hundreds of deals at any given point in time. Doctors are retiring. They're looking to exit. And this gives us an opportunity to look to roll up these primary care practices, these specialty practices, where we can go back to our model of every location on a primary care basis, layer on multidisciplinary services around them, and add incremental revenue and profitability immediately to the business, but then grow on that existing acquisition as well. So if we look recently at our last two acquisitions, we announced uh, an acquisition in Texas of a clinic group, 1.6 million in revenue, 10,000 patients and 300,000 in profit. We paid about 980 for it, so somewhere around 3.7 times EBITDA. Uh, if we look at the acquisition we made just this week, um, it was a Washington-based medical clinic. Um, again, very similar multiples, 3.7 times EBITDA. So these clinics are already established. They're turnkey. All we have to do is go in from our management expertise. We know that we can affect change immediately on the business, make it more efficient, drive higher profits from the existing company. But we also know where money's left on the table. And that allows us to come in and really drive growth and revenue from an existing business that may not be fully optimizing their potential. Plus, it gives us the expertise and management and scale to be able to add these additional services. And this is how we'll continue to grow. Again, the focus for us is total number of patients that we can help in the U.S. times being able to capture as much of their health care spend per year that is being covered by health insurance providers. And that is ultimately where I think our business model will be valued and go towards. So this gives you an example of some of the deal flow we're looking at the multiples that we're talking about. We are looking at a land and expand model. So acquisitions are an easy way for us to expand into, into a new state. Regulatory restrictions are harder to open the first clinic. So acquiring the clinic in um, helps us 
accelerate this six month process into an existing state. So this will be part of our strategy in identifying acquisitions, as well as deepening our exposure within our existing states as well. Um, so just as, as an update, you know, we do have roughly about 143 million shares issued in outstanding prior to the announcement of the financing from today. Um, we still have strong insider ownership, um, both within our institutional investors, as well as founders, owners, and manager and insiders. Um, and we'll continue to build the business at least towards the direction in, that we're discussing in terms of broader healthcare opportunities and where we think the U.S. offers us the greatest landscape and runway for, for growth. Um, the business has obviously performed well over the last couple of months. We've had far more uh, appreciation, I suppose, for the story in terms of where we are and where we are in comparison to our other peers. Um, the, the strengthening of our balance sheet, the improvement of our cash position, um, and obviously on a profitable basis allows us to really kind of drive forward on growth now. And we believe that as we continue to execute, we'll continue to close the gap on where health, on where CB2, we believe still currently trades um, on a rel relatively undervalued basis compared to our other comparables out there today. Um, we're still led by a strong management and team, uh, highly experienced in healthcare from operations to finance, um, uh, to, to overall US understanding landscapes, and especially on our board of directors from telemedicine to pharmaceutical and, uh, and sort of in a larger data monetization and, and commercialization space. Um, so Paul, I'll pause there. I know I kind of ran through that presentation quickly and uh, wanted to, hopefully that's a good update on the company and, and certainly would love to you know, entertain any questions. Perfect. Uh, Brad, you did a great job because I think you covered up about 80% of my, maybe 90% of my questions. So, um, no, fantastic. Um, the, uh, how long have you been a public company? Uh, so March, 2019, we went public. Okay. So, and how much money was raised when you went public? We did a, uh, we did a $6 million financing of which 4 million of that was raised by a debt note, a note payable that was held by Merida Capital, which is our, today our single largest equity shareholder, institutional shareholder. That debt was converted uh, this month into equity. So that, that note is gone. On top of the debt, we had another $2 million of equity uh, that was funded partially by Merida and then through others as well. Okay, gotcha. And how many acquisitions uh, have you done to date? Uh, one when we were private, and yeah. we've done uh, another five since going public. So six in total. Okay. And and yeah, yeah by by what I could tell, there's uh, there's obviously no shortage of other opportunities for you guys. Um, no. give, give, give give me a sense of the because M and A is not as easy as it sounds. Give me a sense of your um, your team that evaluates and sort of integrates these these operations. Okay, so we have, um, you're right, so every, every deal is considered differently. There's a time for digestion, and obviously on the diligence side, we're, we're very thorough in the way we approach this. Um, so functionally, we have uh, strong expertise in the U.S. healthcare market. We have our finance team, our operational team, and then, of course, sort of our, our overall sort of um, uh, clinical management team as well. So when we approach each of these acquisitions, you know, we're, we're keenly identifying within these clinics the stickiness of patients, um, the, the successful uh, sort of receivables on the billing side, especially when you're dealing with insurance companies, mm -hmm. the makeup and structure of the clinic, getting an understanding of the workflow. I mean, we're not looking for highly efficient clinics. We're looking for opportunities where we know we're going to be able to bring in our expertise to improve on. Um, we certainly look at transition time. Most providers are selling because they're retiring. And so we recognize that. And quite honestly, we would like to actually move on from the existing founder as well. So Part of this is establishing a period of transition where it's more about the continuity of care for the patients more than anything else. Um, because again, these businesses we know very well and are, and are already in a position to move in and take over from day one. Um, so there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a diligence process to your point. Every M&A transaction is difficult. Um, we're sitting on a robust pipeline of, of deal flow right now, well over 10 million at this point. And the reality is it's not the same deals all the time. They go in and out all, as we continue to move to our diligence stage. But they're so frequent in the amount and frequency that they come up that, uh, again, we're, we're never really short of looking at new opportunities. It's just a question of making sure we're looking at the right ones for us. And what, what's the competition like in the M&A space for, for this category? Um, I imagine, you know, obviously with some of the bigger names um, doing as well as they are, there's, there's plenty of capital, but you must be seeing competition when you're trying to buy some of these companies. Uh, competition is localized. So there aren't a lot of national roll-up players. And even if there were, I mean, we're talking about the U.S. market, the depth of the market is massive. You, mm. you know, hard, be hard-pressed to come across anybody unless you, you really are looking at the same target. 
Um, so typically we'll compete against uh, hospital networks. You know, the family doctor office is kind of falling to the wayside in the US. Most of them are rolling into whether the larger health insurance hospitals or the hospital network. So that's typically where we see them go. Um, or it's if you're looking at a very specific category of a special subspecialty, you know, you do get private equity groups that are, you know, doing roll-up plays within the space. And so that's where we'll see comp more competition is sort of in the subspecialty area. In the primary care space, it's not as it's not as competitive, I would say. But then again, it's it's dependent state by state, region by region. Mm -hmm. And, and give me a sense of the structure of the typical M&A deal or deal that you're, you're acquiring. What does it look like? Uh, cash, debt, um, you know, earn out? What, what, how does it usually look? So with the acquisitions that we've done to date, uh, they've been cash-based. So at the deal sizes we're looking at, which is sort of in the one to one and a half million dollar size revenue spaces, um, mm -hmm. you know, these are relatively low enough where it's just a cash-based transaction. It's a single mm -hmm. practitioner who's, who's moving on. Um, and it doesn't really make sense to look at it from a stock perspective, plus we're not necessarily dealing with someone we're going to lock up for a period of time and have an earn out attached to it. So um, that's the ideal setup for that type of acquisition. That's what allows us to get such low multiples on the acquisition as well. Um, we're paying, like for Washington, we paid, you know, sub 0.3 times revenue, I think, or I guess a little bit more now. But uh, so if we if we look at a share-based acquisition, we're typically looking at larger deal targets. So and we do have in our pipeline deal flows that are somewhere between the three million to seven million dollar range, uh, revenue uh, size range. Um, certainly, where profitability, of course, is, is substantially higher as well. These deals will be structured more within a cash and stock-based award because, of course, we want some of these founders to stick around longer because they are larger companies and the transition time will be long. And in some cases where the company has strong growth potential, um, we'll consider earnouts as well. But again, we have a very functional and structured team in the U.S. That, that runs our business. And I have no doubt that our team can do just as efficient job in these clinics as some of these management staff within the existing acquisitions can do. Oh, great. Um, now, you, you showed a slide there. You were saying you guys are currently trading at, at a multiple of what to revenue? Um, so yeah. I believe at this point we're trading, well, I had to look back on when this update was, but uh, yeah, it's about three times. Yeah. Um, it's about three times this year's sort of revenue target is where, where we're at right now. I think that might have gone up a little bit now, but yeah. Yeah, and uh, quite low compared to your peers. What I find fascinating is uh, you're able to buy, you know, these these uh, small companies for call it one times revenue. You're getting a three times multiple. It's it's a pretty phenomenal arbitrage uh, as far as capital uh, uh, being allocated here. Um, so as long as you've got a healthy pipeline of acquisitions and you get a good uh, valuation, it's just it's a uh, you're, you're engineering success pretty easily then. Um, so, uh, yeah, and, and again, Paul, it's, it's it's about the it's about the acquisition size. It's also mm -hmm. about what you do with the acquisition after, right? So, I mean, buying the asset for what it is brings incremental revenue and profit. That's great, um, but it's about how do I take that 1.6 million and make it 3 million and 5 million and build on that existing infrastructure. So, there is a strong drive to be organically driven as well. So, I mean, the acquisitions give us a head start. They give us a turnkey operation. But we know that on, on acquisition, and this is part of the consideration of each deal, it's how much more do we think we can add to this business in two to three years from now? And how do we get there in the fastest way possible, right? So that's, that's, that's part of the due diligence as well. And part of the integration is let's give the first 90 days a chance for cultural integration. But once that's done, we're going to start to look at optimizing those revenues further. Right. And what, what kind of, if any, are there new services and offerings that you guys don't have right now that you want to bring to the table? Um, well, I mean, we're going to be looking to add on a number of different sort of accretive subspecialties around mm -hmm. each patient. I mean, if we go back to this slide and look at what our business model really is, it's yes, we want to acquire as many of the general practitioner clinics and organically build our clinics into offering these primary care services because it's the stickiness, it's the glue, it's what holds the patients to the clinic. Um, but it's really these call it, you know, value add services that go around the primary care doctor that ultimately, you know, most clinics don't tend to capitalize on. It's the ability to bring these in-house and have the patient say, look, you don't have to go to 10 different places for all these services. You come here and we'll service you for everything. And now that you can utilize telemedicine in a much more functional way, most of these services don't even have to be scaled locally to a region. So it could be a counselor that we hire within one region and are able to scale across their other clinics by utilizing telemedicine. And it's going to benefit patients tremendously. So I think this innovation for us will come from two ways. One is the way we deliver healthcare more effectively. And secondly, 
the types of services we bring in that are going to layer in for patients, but will ultimately also help us as a company drive the, the annual healthcare spend um, up per patient. Perfect. I know we're really short on time, so I want to give you uh, the opportunity to sort of um, finish anything else that you need to say. But um, I think we've got five minutes and we've got one question in from one of our listeners um, and it's related to, um, I think you guys just went through a name change or you're about to change your name, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Maybe just explain what uh, what's happening there. Yeah, so uh, at the end of November, we'll go through a rebranding. Um, Skylight Health uh, will be the new name for the company uh, as it's more reflective, again, of our U.S. operations. Um, so CB2 will change to Skylight Health. We'll also go through a full digital rebrand as well, so from our branding to websites, et cetera, and it will be part of also our model and look and feel within the clinics in the U.S., plus our services, telemedicine offerings, um, mm -hmm. et cetera. So that, that will come into effect at the end of November. Okay, fantastic. Is it likely to be a, a simple change as well? Uh, well, we're working towards it now, so everything will be set mm -hmm. in place in order for it to be okay. done, but, uh, you know, we want to make sure everything is clean and proper. You got it. You got it. Perfect. Um, okay, great. Um, you know, because we've only got a couple minutes left, what we usually like to do is just leave it up to you. If there's any key message you want our listeners and investors to sort of uh, walk away from uh, with today, um, you know, maybe you can wrap it up and, and give us that key message. Yeah, I mean, look, I think, you know, for anyone that's, that's listening and looking at the U.S. healthcare market as an opportunity, um, I spent, you know, five years in the U.S. market after being here for over 20 years and, and running practice and running medical sort of centers. And I see that the opportunity the U.S. has to offer is just uncovering itself. I think we're going to see huge disruption to the way the healthcare services are delivered. I think we're going to see disruption to the way insurance companies provide care to patients. Um, and I think all this lends very well to outpatient organizations who ultimately in the day have a mandate to keep patients out of emergency rooms. So I think if we, you know, looking forward at the growth potential we have as an organization, looking at our peers like Oak Street that can generate $800 million of revenue a year on a few hundred thousand patients and are still targeting to double, triple that, that revenue growth. You know, I think we're just scratching the surface as to where we are today. I think we're well positioned both financially, structurally, but also operationally to you know affect that change well and so we're gonna you know, we're gonna certainly keep going down this path and, and certainly hopefully we'll present an opportunity for investors to play in the u.s healthcare uh, services space you know with cb2 insights and soon to be skylight health fantastic uh prad uh thank you for joining us today uh cb2 insights um if somebody wants more information uh, what's your website address so cb2insights.com or they can also email us at investors at cb2insights.com as well Fantastic. Uh, congratulations. Um, uh, good luck with uh, your ongoing uh, execution. And uh, at this point, Trevor, I'm going to hand it back to you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for joining us today, Prad. And uh, as Paul mentioned, we're looking forward to uh, a future update and uh, closing this financing and we'll be in touch soon. Well, thanks for having us, guys. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Prad. Thanks, Prad.